Ja, som vi hörde i inslaget så är det alltså True Crime-makarna som är den undersökande journalistikens nya vita riddare. Och vi har ju bjudit hit de två främsta just nu. Det är Laura Ricciardi och Mora Dimus. Välkommen! Hot shots now in Sweden. <laughs> wow. uh, uh, Thank you for saying that. We, we talked before, and you said that this is the first time you're out uh, outside the U.S. talking about uh, the series. That's right. Yeah, it's so exciting to be traveling outside of the U.S. Yeah. and to meet people that you know have seen the series and yeah. want to talk about it. Well, you you really made a television history. I think it's a great series. Thank you. Um, as we heard here before, it's serial. Uh, you didn't hear it because you don't understand. Swedish. <laughs> As they spoke about serial, the jinx, making murder. Uh, you could really say that uh, the true crime is the new black now, so to speak. Uh, uh, why is it so appealing to the public, do you think? Well, you know, I mean, all these true crime stories are different, but, you know, one thing most true crime has in common is there are high stakes. You know, they're usually complex characters with very high stakes. so. People get drawn into the stories, and then the fact that it's true crime, that this is real, I think just elevates the audience's investment oh. in what they see. Nice. But, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I do think people are responding to this as true crime, but, you know, we set out to make, and we think we made, a social justice film. Uh, when you started filming in 2005, uh, what made you interested in, in this case? Well, it was November of 2005, and Stephen Avery appeared on the front page of the New York Times, and the headline read, Freed by DNA, now charged in new crime. And that immediately piqued our interest, first of all, because um, he was exonerated in 2003, so he was actually one of Wisconsin's first DNA exonerees. And what we really wanted to know was, here was a person with incredibly unique status. He'd been wrongly convicted, served 18 years for a crime he did not commit. And here he was 20 years after that conviction back in the system. And we wanted to understand or explore the extent to which the American criminal justice system had evolved over those 20 years. Uh, after the series was broadcasted, or, uh, several EURO members uh, changed their minds. There were over 400,000 people signing a petition to, to uh, President Obama. Uh, are you surprised that the series made such a commotion? Well, I, I think the series has a lot of really disturbing scenes in it. Um, a lot of things that people didn't know. You know, this was a very high-profile case, in, at least in Wisconsin, but also in the U.S. So people had heard about it, but there was so much they hadn't heard. So I think it's understandable that people have a very strong reaction to all of this disturbing information. Mm. Uh, innan vi pratar vidare om det här tio avsnitt långa rättegångsdramat så ska alla ni som inte känner till fallet Steven Avery få lite dokumentärt kött på benen. Detta har hänt. Oh, hello. How are you? Oh, pretty good. How's it feel? It was wonderful. This was one of the biggest miscarriages of justice I ever saw in 20 years of criminal defense work and thousands of cases. Making a murderer tar avstamp i ett 30 år gammalt kriminalfall. Steven Avery från Manitowoc, Wisconsin sitter i fängelse 18 år för våldtäkt innan han frias år 2003 genom DNA-bevisning. It was rough the whole 18 years. We're seeking compensation for the loss of his freedom. Avery inleder då en rättsprocess mot Manitowoc County för att få skadestånd. Men han hinner knappt komma tillbaka till vardagen innan han drabbas av ett nytt bakslag. Strax efter att han lämnat in en stämningsansökan grips han igen. Den här gången för mordet på Teresa Hallback. Things did not go well for Stephen Avery here in court this afternoon. The judge allows special prosecutor. 2007 faller livstidsdomen. Who shot her in the head? He did. Även Stephen Averys brorson Brendan Dassey döms för medhjälp till mord. 
The horrible picture of how Teresa Harbuck died. Making a murderer är skapad av den före detta advokaten Laura Ricciardi och filmklipparen Mora Dimos som har följt fallet under ett helt decennium. Serien har engagerat, men den har också anklagats för att vara hårt vinklad till Averys fördel. I didn't do it. Who did it? I don't know. Steve. I don't know. I know. Steve. Think of your family here for a I second. am thinking of my family. No, you're not. You're thinking of yourself. No. Well, the question on everybody's lips is, of course, uh, did he do it? Did Steven Avery murder uh, Teresa Holbeck? I'm asking you. You're asking guys. me. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, was it proven that he did it beyond a reasonable doubt? I, I have many doubts. I have so many answer, unanswered questions yeah. after this mammoth investigation. So, you I know, know that I you're very reluctant answered. to answer the question of the, the guilt. Is it because, uh, why, why is it? We just, we don't feel we're in a position to, to judge him in that way. We were there really to, to witness and document the process. We wanted to understand the history that came before and to view the new case through that lens. So when we started examining what had gone wrong in 1985 and what had continued to go wrong for another 18 years, um, we recognized that there were lots of problems in the system, many ways in which people on all sides failed Stephen Avery. And so, um, you know, we came away from this believing that the prosecution had not proven its case and that he, both he and Brendan Dassey are entitled, in our opinion, to new trials. But maybe it's the question of guilt that it has made the show so popular that keeps mm -hmm. us watching and speculating. How do you feel about viewers investigating online? I mean, I think, again, that's very understandable because I think viewers leave the series with a lot of questions. You know, you don't end the last episode with everything answered and tied up in a bow. You have so many questions. And so I think, you know, it's understandable people are going online and discussing their theories and trying to dig up evidence in the court files or... But, um, you know, the people that were in the position to solve the crime were the investigators. and. You know, so these armchair sleuths are there just because it wasn't solved already. All right. Uh, you get really pissed off, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> when you see the police manipulate the, the, the Brendan, the nephew, mm -hmm. Brendan. Uh, they manipulate him towards a confession. And, and uh, do you think that this maltreatment of Stephen and Brendan was done with malice or just incompetence? I think in certain respects, the line was crossed. And um, for instance, Len Kaczynski, who was Brendan's appointed defense attorney, and his defense investigator, Michael O'Kelly, these were people who were tasked with representing Brendan and his interests and trying to ensure that the process would be fair to him. And they, in my opinion, so clearly violated him as well. I mean, the violations were coming from both sides with respect to Brendan Dassey's case, and that was just mm. brutal, in my opinion. So yeah. with respect to um, the investigators in Stephen's case, I think a big issue we had with it was the conflict of interest and the fact that the prosecutor in these pre televised press conferences would say, you know, or the sheriff even, that Manitowoc County would have nothing to do with this investigation. They were there only to provide resources. And of course, what we learned later was that the same officers who had a conflict of interest or created it were the ones in Stephen Avery's bedroom, in his garage, and who were finding some of the most damning evidence against him. Yeah. Still, you received some uh, uh, criticism that claims that your series was biased. Mm -hmm. What's your comment on that? I mean, I couldn't disagree more. You know, there's a reason this took us 10 years to make, because we took the time to do our research, to fact check, to, you know, corroborate things, to look in the records and make sure that what we were putting into the series was true. Um, 
you know, there's been so many reports since the launch of the series that, you know, I read the article and it doesn't seem like the person, you know, even asked one probing question to see if what they're writing about is true. No. So, you know, we stand behind what we did as fair and accurate. Yeah, yeah but I doesn't the thought. title itself, Making a Murderer, indicate that you somewhere believe that he's innocent? Well, it's interesting. I, I've heard different responses from viewers. You know, some people take away that, you know, he was wrongly convicted in 1985, and a lot of people have talked about how it's those years in prison that made him into a murderer, and that that's what made him into a murderer. Some people think, you know, it's that the prosecution just spun this fanciful tale that he was a murderer. So I think the title has different meanings to different people. All right. And what's the meaning to you? I think it's all of those meanings. It's, there are so many, there are so many ways one can end up convicted of murder. Maybe you murdered somebody, maybe you didn't. You've been living with this case over a decade. Uh, you've been traveling between New York, I think, and, and Wisconsin. And you've been pretty close, I guess, to the uh, Avery family. Mm -hmm. how, how, how did this um, affect you on a personal level? I, I feel like I grew as a person from this experience because um, it was very heart-wrenching to spend that much time and intimate time with a family that from their perspective, they were enduring a second wrongful conviction. And when we met them, this was a family that was operating with the knowledge of what it would be like to have a loved one wrongly convicted and wrongly imprisoned. Um, so when Stephen was charged in the second crime, they were horrified because they'd already spent 18 years, you know, fight, helping him fight to get out. Uh, one of the strengths <laughs> of the series is that uh, the case kind of evolves as we speak. Mm. Uh, uh, what is the latest uh, development in the case? After the documentary came out, one of the developments was uh, an Illinois-based lawyer just outside of Chicago who has apparently won a number of cases where she's had wrongful convictions overturned and actually the true perpetrator was caught in those cases or half of them, she decided to take Stephen Avery's case. So he has a new lawyer and uh, she's working right now to try to get the court to look at his case again. Wow. And what about you? Can we see like <laughs> 10 more episodes or? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, part of it will depend on what happens in real life, you know, because in a documentary, you never know. But, um, I mean, we're prepared to keep following this story if there are developments, yeah. Uh, when did you last uh, speak to Stephen Avery? I think it was about two weeks ago. Okay. He called us from prison. So you're keeping the contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a nice call, too, because he was encouraged. He'd received lots of letters of support. I think he said at that point he had about 150 letters and he was trying diligently to respond to them. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yeah, he told so. us, you know, he wanted to try to write each person their own letter back. Yeah, so yeah. He, he was joking <laughs> that he had a lot of work to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what is your next project going to be about? Maybe a, a series of that when you're investigating who really did kill Theresa Holbach? I don't know if that's the job of any television show. I think that's, <laughs> you know, the job for the police. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But is, can I just... Yeah, of course. But isn't it strange that, you know, we don't, like, no one cares about that case. Like, who actually killed if he's innocent? Like, what, what happened to... I think that's... Where a, is the murderer, you know? It's, I mean, no that's a great point. No one brings that up during yeah, because the, It's an excellent point. You know, yeah. Yeah. In any wrongful conviction case, if, if you ever get the wrong person, that means the person who did something terrible is on the streets. So, you know, we should all care about that, not just the family. Thank you very much for coming to the show. Oh, it was our pleasure. Thank you for having us.
Ja, kära publik, det var allt för den här gången. Glöm inte vårt filmquiz. Som vanligt var ju startvignetten trufferad med en hel del citat från kända filmer. Om det var svårt att hänga med så kan ni lyssna en gång till på Facebook eller på SVT Play. Och där kan ni också se alla tidigare avsnitt av Babel Bio. Det här var som sagt det sista avsnittet av Babel Bio, men mycket tyder på att film- och tv-seriebranschen ändå rullar på. Och vill ni ha recensioner och nyheter därifrån så klickar ni såklart in er på Kulturnyheternas eminenta webb. Vi ses där. Hej då.